Doug Stout. It's December 5th, 2014. I'm here with Robert Hall. Robert, where were you born? Mount Vernon. Okay. What? What's your birthday? Uh, February 27th, 1939. And when did you come to Licking County? About? Uh, probably in the summer of 1953. Uh, my father and mother separated and my dad lived at the time uh, down around St. Louisville. Okay. And my mother, of course, stayed in Mount Vernon. Okay. And I went to school at, in Utica at the high school there during my entire high school career. Okay, so you graduated from Utica High School? Utica, Washington, yeah. Okay. So when did you go into the service? Immediately after high school. I actually enlisted in February of 1957, uh, probably within a couple of weeks after my 18th birthday. Uh, my intentions were to join the Navy. I went to the Navy and he said, well, yeah, I'll be happy to take you. And I said, when can you get me out of town? And he said, oh, about December. So I went, uh, walked past the Air Force recruiting station and he said, oh, I can take you in July. Get me out of here. So I did. And uh, I left town on the uh, 7th day of July in 1957. So you were, you were just graduating almost. About oh, yeah. I'd have went the day after graduation if I could have. You could have. They could have sure. Taken you. What made you decide to go in the military? Uh, it was a quick way to get out of town and get away from home. Okay. Uh, my home life uh, up to that point had not been real uh, fun. Okay. So, so where did you go for your basic? Lackland Air Force Base, Texas, which is still, still uh, that, and I uh, was scheduled for eight weeks of basic training. Uh, Got there, oh, probably about the tenth, I suppose. Most of that trip back then was out of Columbus by train. Okay. Train to St. Louis, and and then from then on down to San Antonio, Texas. So then you were there, and then you probably went on for further schooling from there. Yeah, or? I l was actually pulled out of basic training about two, three weeks early. Uh, my original assignment was to be a air traffic controller, and I was really excited about that because. Uh, in the 50s, air travel was just starting to really boom, and uh, it would have been a really lucrative career. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of a neat thing to do. Well, uh, I got to when I, while I was at a basic training, they called me in for some further testing, and uh, sent me to then to Biloxi, Mississippi, to Keesler Air Force Base, and trained me as a Morse intercept operator. Uh, essentially, what that means is you copy Morse code. Uh, being sent by other nations. Okay. So, so something, some test you took obviously showed you had an aptitude for that? Yes. Had you ever done anything like that? With no, I never had. I never, I was never in the scouts or anything like that, so I never had any uh, exposure to Morse code. Uh, however, I was pretty good at music and I was a drummer. Okay. And I don't know whether that had anything to do with it or not. So, uh, and so I attended school at, in Biloxi uh, until the following year. It takes about eight to ten months to get through that school okay. because there's other facets of it, the intelligence portions. Uh, and that school is still in effect, by the way, at Kiesel. They're still training, but not near as many people as they, as they used to just because uh, with the advent of all the new equipment and telephones and that kind of thing. There's very little Morse code being used right. anymore. Did, did, you, did they want you to learn any languages? So no, I did not okay. do languages. Over a period of my career, you know, I learned a little Turkish, a little Italian, a little, a little bit of Russian, and a little bit of German, and that kind of thing, but only because I was living in that area or working with guys who had been trained in languages. Uh, language training back then was done in uh, Syracuse, New York, and uh, some of it was done out in California. So then, so once you got through with your training, where did you go? Directly to Trapezon, Turkey. Trapezon, Turkey is uh, the last town on the Turkish coast heading east uh, in the Black Sea. Okay. It's just a few miles from what was then the Armenian border. And uh, when I got there, I found that we were working on top of a mountain. Uh, that looked right down into the Russian landmass across the Black Sea. We had uh, a Quonset hut, 
a barn, and three semi vans. And that was the entire base. How many guys were there about? You know, I don't know. Okay. I would probably somewhere around 40 if there was okay. that many. Uh, most of we lived uh, in down in the town at the bottom of the mountain, uh, three and four at a time to, you know, apartments that we rented. And uh, we had a house downtown that housed the commanding officer and had a room about uh, all the size of a large bathroom that was the place to buy cigarettes and socks and that kind of stuff. Right. So did you like your stay there? I mean... Oh no, that was pretty miserable back then. Just uh, the living conditions? Or? Yeah, the living conditions generally. And uh, Trabazon, I would assume even today, is probably 200 years behind the rest of the world. Wow. Uh, very, very basic, very primitive. Uh, I shared an apartment with two other gentlemen who have since passed away, both those guys. Uh, and we had a Turkish maid to come in and just kind of kept the place clean and uh, bought groceries for us and that kind of thing. Uh, her name was Julie. Don't have a last name. I had some pictures. And uh, she had 14 children. Oh my goodness. Yeah, she had 14 children. And what she made as a maid working for us supported the majority of that family. I mean, they were just like, you know, making popcorn, man. One, one every year, you know. Uh, her husband spent most of his day uh, down in the city, drinking tea and playing cards or dominoes. Wow. Yeah. So, so your job there was to, I guess, eavesdrop on the Russians? Exactly. Uh, back during that time, we're talking about 1958 and 59, uh, ICBMs were uh, part of the Cold War, uh, as well as we were working hard, uh, as the United States was, to put uh, somebody in orbit and establish uh, a place in that space program. Uh, and right, be right across from Trapezon, uh, uh, just northeast of the Black Sea, is an area, uh, a town called Batumi, and an area called Turatom, and that's where the launch sites were. Okay, so that so you were intercepting stuff that wasn't too far away, I mean. Well, across the Black Sea. The Black Sea's not very far away, obviously. You know. Right. And uh, our job primarily was to uh, copy, decode uh, messages that they were sending to Moscow or wherever uh, about their space program and what they were doing and uh, any information that we could get. So you knew everything before any of the rest of us knew anything? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. We knew we were able to decode uh, most of their communications pretty quickly. There was very little stuff that we couldn't decode right on site. And so if they sent and said, okay, the countdown will be at such and such a time tomorrow, we're going to launch at 8 o'clock, we knew that when they told the rest of their people. And then how did you get how did you get those messages back? To, I mean, how did that, that chain work? I mean, there wasn't email, there wasn't... Well, we had, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, other electronic uh, ways. Teletype was an example. Okay. You know, we could take that message, recode it, in our code, put it on teletype and send it to whomever, mostly the Joint Chiefs, uh, our, our, our unit and that unit in general, even today, supports the National Security Agency and the CIA. I would imagine now that the uh, Homeland Security's probably got their hands in it, and some and as well, and the FBI of course. Right. Uh, but that's that's what our job was to collect that intelligence. Well, that's why I was wondering how you got it back because I figured they're probably they were probably listening to you too. No, they weren't. They, they weren't. didn't have the capability to do that because our coding system was so sophisticated that they weren't able to break it. They were constantly working on it. Right. We know that because we read their messages. Right. Uh, but uh, for the most part, they weren't able to break our stuff down. And we would send it to teletype, and you just can't copy teletype. Right. It just don't. This won't work. So how long were you there in Turkey then? Just a year. Okay. Just a year. Uh, uh, interesting to note that during that time, uh, the city of Mount Vernon and this area was involved in flooding, a lot of flooding, mm -hmm. and that was in 1959. Oh, yeah. I remember uh, distinctly uh, the uh, Air Force Times, which is an Air Force newspaper, being delivered and opening it up and the front page was a picture of Mount Vernon underwater. 
Because Newark, Newark was under a lot of water, too. Absolutely. I think it was up to the courthouse steps, if I remember yeah. somebody telling me, so I don't know how high. Did you know you were only going to be there a year when, did you know it was only a year? Yeah, assignment? that was considered, uh, they call, called that a remote assignment, uh, just because there weren't much in the way of facilities. Uh, and uh, once you pulled one of those, why you normally got a pretty good choice of where you were going to go after that. So what was your choice then? Well, my choice back then was I wanted to go to a place called Mountain Home, Idaho. It's up in the mountains. I don't think that the, the facility up there is still working. Uh, it would be like going to another remote assignment. Uh, but I wanted to do some fishing and hunting and, and that kind of thing. And uh, so that's where I told them I wanted to go. Well, they looked at me kind of funny, and I didn't get to go there. Uh, because I had a top secret code word clearance uh, for security purposes, uh, made me very uh, lucrative to get into other commands. Right. You know, uh, the job that I did at that time as a Morris Intercept operator, no place to do that here in the United States, or nobody to copy. So when you came back to the United States, they gave you an additional uh, job title, trained you to do something else, and uh, you got to stay in the States for a year, maybe two, and then they'd pack you up, ship you back overseas to do another assignment. Uh, I worked in administration, you know, literally, uh, for several years. They kind of lost track of me, I think, and so I was out of that command and out of that type of work for almost six years. So where were you then? Uh, I, the mountain home assignment didn't, didn't uh, gel, uh, and I ended up going to Tactical Air Command headquarters in Hampton, Virginia. Okay. And not very close to how mountain home I know, obviously. No. And I was there, I was assigned to work for a, a, a bird colonel who was um, uh, establishing an intelligence office at TAC headquarters. They had an intelligence office of some kind, but his job was to enhance it and make it uh, usable, let's okay. say. <clears throat> so having a top secret code word clearance worked out with his plans really well. Uh, and I stayed there until, uh, until he left in uh, 1961. By that time, I had I had uh, re-enlisted mm -hmm. for another four years, and uh, he went to the colonel went to Seward Air Base in Tennessee, which no longer exists, uh, to command a wing of C-130s. Uh, and uh, by golly, he was gone about a month, and I got orders to go to Seward Air Base in Tennessee. One of my best assignments in 20 plus years. Did you hunt and fish around there? Oh yeah, absolutely. Wonder. My wife and I go to Tennessee a lot. We still have a lot of friends down there from back in the 60s. Uh, so at that time, were you planning on making a career? Did you think you'd just stay in? Well, I, I think when I re-enlisted that first time, uh, would have made my total a, at eight years, you know? And I think I had probably told myself at that point that you might as well stay with this, you know? Uh, when you get out at the end of 20, the benefits are are not too bad. The pay's, the retirement pay's terrible, but the, right. <laughs> it's, other than that, it's not bad. That's good. So then from Tennessee, you went? Well, after about six years, the security service, where I was stationed as a Morris operator, the security service found me, <laughs> and they came and got me, and I was shipped to uh, uh, San Vito, uh, Italy, uh, which is in the south of, of Italy. If you visualize Italy as a boot, because that's right on the heel of the boot. Uh, the name of the town uh, adjacent to that is Brindisi, a very, very old town. goes clear down, clear back into the Roman days. Okay. It's a stepping off point for, for people coming down from Europe through Italy to the heel of the boot to Brindisi, right over to Athens, Greece. Boat rides about an hour. Okay. So who were you listening to there? Well, some of the same stuff, actually, but in that area, obviously, we had other other places to listen to and do. The Cold War at that time was still going full blast. I mean, it was just, you know, everything was going on for those of you who weren't around back then. Right. <clears throat> we had Bulgaria, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia. Right across the Adriatic from Brindisi is, is uh, Albania, who are, even today, is always a rattle on a, say, right. a sword of some kind. 
uh, and uh, so it was a really busy time. And at that time, the United States developed an antenna system that was unique. Uh, it was a circular array, lovingly called those by those that used it the elephant cage, and we had a setup of those clear around the world. You could pick up a signal on this thing from 4,000 miles away, an HF signal, uh, which was most Morse code and that kind of thing. We had uh, about a hundred positions copying code there 24 hours a day. So there was little or nothing going on in the world that we didn't know about. How, excuse my ignorance, but how, I mean, how often are, were the messages going back and forth then? I mean, well, it's, you know, it, watch politics today. <clears throat> if Benghazi happens, you can imagine the number of messages that were passed between different uh, parts of the United States government in a matter of two or three hours. You know, uh, and that's one of the ways to tell when something's going on somewhere. The amount of communications will double, triple, quadruple. You know, and they will be high priority communications. So, so that kept you very busy. I mean, you oh yeah, that was a really busy time. You know, we're talking uh, back in '61, '62, '63, '64, '65, uh, and uh, you know. Uh, from an intelligence standpoint, uh, the world was a really busy place. The dew line was established back then, right? Uh, and uh, you know the Russians were rattling theirs, and we'd rattle ours, and and uh, what can I tell you? It just was a mess everywhere. So was Italy better than Turkey? Oh yeah, I had my wife and kids with me. Oh, okay. For that time, I had two kids, two boys, <coughs> and uh, you know we lived in a. We lived in uh, some pretty decent housing downtown. It didn't didn't live on the base. There was no base housing, then except for the single guys in the barracks. Okay. But uh, found a nice, nice apartment in uh, downtown uh, Brindisi, and uh, uh, the kids went to school on the base, picked up by bus every day, and uh, it was uh, it was a pretty good tour of duty. It was about two and a half years. Okay. So then where? Texas. Um, it was a place for command to kind of park people. Uh, we would there was a, at that time they started uh, taking a lot of routine type communications that were floating around out there, and they would uh, tape them, and then they'd send them back to Texas to a big building back there that had these positions. But instead of having radio receivers, they had tape recorders, and they would tape it, put it down on paper, and somebody could could review it uh, at their leisure. And so I got there and was there about uh, maybe maybe a month and I said to myself, Bob, this is not where you want to be. You know, most of the guys that worked for me had about 25 or 30 under my command and uh, most of these guys were within six months of getting out of the service. Uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of hard work going on. Uh, and uh, Vietnam was starting to really rock and roll then and I said uh, time for me to get on with it so I packed up and from there to Vietnam. And then did your family stay in Texas then? Or? No, no, my family came back to Mount Vernon and stayed in oh, okay. Mount Vernon during that year that I was in I was in uh, Vietnam. In the meantime, instead of uh, working that type of job on the ground, I was trained to do a different kind of job uh, in Vietnam and uh, started flying and doing what I was doing from an airplane. Okay. Interesting piece of work. It was a system developed by again by the United States to do something that had never ever been done any place in the world and it was radio direction finding. Well, normally you've got two or three sites who have this capability a radio signal comes up you do the radio direction finding and find out where it's located. In the jungle in a combat zone, that's not really possible. The enemy tends to blow you up and do those kind of nasty things. Somebody got this bright idea that they could do that from an airplane, and they developed uh, that system and made it work. One of the companies involved with that was Texas Instruments, which is still a big, big company. Right. Um, computers played a big part of that. Uh, you know, prior to that time, computers had been huge. 
not feasible to just put on an airplane and go fly around with them. They were too big. Uh, but computers then were getting down to where they were suitcase size. And uh, that's what made that, that work. And so we were able to go up and uh, pick up a walkie-talkie, I mean a, uh, a handheld walkie-talkie that the enemy was using and identify him and say, oh yeah, we know who that is. It's a Viet Cong unit and fly a circle around him and take four or five direction finding hits on the target, tell you within 50 yards where he's standing in the jump. And immediately call the ground, tell the ground where that is, the name of the unit you've found, who they are, where they are, you know what happens next. Artillery starts pounding them or they call in uh, aircraft and, and do strafing runs and we were still using napalm back then. Right. What, um, what kind of plane were you on? C-47. Uh, they're called Goonie Birds. Uh, that, they got that name back uh, during the Japanese-American War uh, because the Goonie Birds and the, and the birds that are real Goonie Birds look about the same when they land. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the C-47 uh, was also uh, was originally named a DC-3 and was Delta Airlines first commercial airplane. Uh, they used DC-3s to uh, function the Berlin airlift. Uh, they flew the Burma Hump okay. uh, with supplies and so forth and uh, dropped paratroopers on D-Day and some of the airplanes we had were literally that old. Uh, I was, uh, by that time I went to Vietnam, by that time I was, had been on active duty for uh, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I went in in December of 67, just before Christmas. And uh, there was, most of the airplanes that I was flying on then were older than I was. I mean, some of them were, we were talking about clear back into the 40s when these airplanes were built. Right. Uh, the problem they had with that when they decided to use mm -hmm. those airplanes was that everybody could fly them. Uh, they're just, they didn't use them on a daily basis like the C-130 and, and, uh, and now the C-17 and some of those. Uh, so they started looking around for somebody who could fly these airplanes and the only piece in the people, or most of the people they found were full bird colonels sitting in the Pentagon who were just putting their, kind of putting right. their time in, you know, doing staff positions and that kind of thing. And all of a sudden, these poor guys were finding themselves in an assignment, going to a combat zone right. to refly again. You know, so we were fortunate. We were fortunate in that we had those kind of guys available, and we were fortunate because they were really damn good pilots. I mean, you know, uh, I had a pilot uh, on a crew that I flew with a lot, and the pilot's name was John Berge. John passed away a few years back. And I'll tell you, he saved our hash more than one just because he was good at what he did. You know, he'd already flown these things in combat areas. Right. And he knew what it was like to take ground fire and, and that kind of thing. And uh, by golly, what a guy. Did you have armament arm on, on board those planes? Though? No. All of us carried a sidearm, you know. Uh, generally, it was a 38 revolver. Uh, 45s were two on wheelie and... It's like shooting a handheld cannon, uh, and we had uh, M16s on board if we needed them, you know. But no, we didn't have any armament on board, and there was no armament, no protection built in to the airplane either. We the the plan was the lighter the aircraft was, the more fuel you could take. The more fuel you had, the longer you could stay up there. Right. Did the, did the Viet Cong? They probably didn't have any kind of anti-aircraft. Guns. Oh yeah, did they? They had 12 millimeter, 37 millimeter, okay. and I'll get to part of that story later on. Uh, but one of the interesting things was the uh, uh, C-47s were also being used as gunships. Uh, it was a C-47, and they had a Gatling gun mounted in the side of it. Wow. You know, these things were something else. I mean, uh, they could make a, a circle around a football field uh, and put a round in every square foot. You know. 6,000 rounds a minute. You know. uh, when they would fire at night, it was just uh, the, you could see the tracers, right. and the tracers made a solid line all the way to the ground. 
Uh, for anybody that's not familiar with that area, that's a good piece of uh, research on those airplanes. They still have them, uh, only I think there's a, a couple of them still left that they, uh, a, uh, a jungle unit has in, in down in Florida. But uh, then they went from there to a C-130, to a, actually to a C-119, uh, for, then a C-123, and then upgraded it to a C-130. And I actually put two Gatling guns inside and a cannon in the back. Uh, if you're familiar with C-130s, it has a ramp in the back that comes down, you know, uh, to drive a jeep or whatever in and out, and they actually had a cannon in the back of that thing, uh, and it was serious stuff, you know. I guess. So they, so what you had, to, like a daily thing where you went up for a couple hours. After your Our missions were six and a half to eight hours long. Wow. It was depending on uh, how much fuel we had, what was going on. Uh, there were days when we stayed. Because of things that were going on, we stayed to the very last minute and landed on fumes. I mean, we'd run it till it's almost out of gas to stay up there and continue doing our job. Uh, and a good example of that was in early 68, the uh, South Vietnam city of Bami Tuat uh, was attacked by the Kong and, and uh, uh, then the NBA. And uh, the city eventually was burnt to the ground, the whole city. And we had troops in that area. And uh, the Vietnam were moving into that area, and we were able, because of their communications, we were able to spot them and see that they were moving right in towards Bami to it, let our people know so they could bolster their their uh, uh, protection and move out if necessary. And, what was that? and uh, two, there was two of our airplanes. I was in one, and we flew eight hours straight over top of that city, keeping track of where these people were, you know, their command telling them to move to such and such a place and we could have artillery waiting and as soon as they got there work them over. I love. Could they, I don't know how low you were, I mean could they tell you were flying over them and... Eventually they did when 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 the gunships came into the area and I started to go with that a few minutes ago when the gunships first started to go over they didn't want to draw their attention because that was... right. <laughs> Yeah. So if they saw one of our airplanes, they assumed it was a gunship. They didn't mess with us. They left us alone. Okay. Well, there was some differences in the paint jobs on these two airplanes. The gunships on the bottom of the belly of the airplane were painted uh, camouflage and black uh, because a lot of their work was at night. Okay. Our airplanes, on the other hand, the bellies of the airplanes were painted light blue with a touch of white through them. So you, because we flew during the day. And it took them a while, uh, probably uh, mid to late 1968, when they started figuring out, wait a minute, you know, these blue airplanes don't shoot at us, you know. And I would assume there was other stuff going on as well. Um, there were a lot of spies in the area. Uh, the Russians were supporting them. It was just a lot of goings on. Thank you. Drink your coffee. Go ahead. <laughs> it's going to get all cold. So... Uh, did you have any close calls with that? I mean, uh, yeah, you know, we had, uh, it was seldom that we didn't, that our crews, uh, and we flew, you know, six to seven airplanes a day, and they had the, had the, the Vietnam area broke down in areas, and you went up and flew an area, you know. Okay. Uh, and it was probably unusual for them all to come back and not want at least one, have ground fire damage, uh, and worse. Uh, we lost a few airplanes over there from ground fire and and some lightweight anti-aircraft fire. Uh, crews were killed. Uh, crews were wounded and beat up and uh, you know we went in with troops and uh, gunships and so forth trying to get them out. Got some out, some we didn't. Uh, our unit uh, uh, were fair, we were fairly lucky. We only lost 17 people uh, during the entire Vietnam War. Uh, uh, darned unusual, you know, but we were lucky. Um, and we memorialize those, those guys every year. We have a reunion every year of our people, and what we call the backenders, and we have a reunion every year. 
I'm part of that team that sets those reunions up. Uh, in fact, going to Gettysburg next week to do just that. Um, we have uh, a C-47 on display uh, in uh, Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. That's where we were trained to do that particular job. And uh, all of the people that were killed have been honored down there in some fashion, the name of a building and so forth. We have a hall of honor down there as well. How, what were your living conditions like over in Vietnam? Pretty good, uh, considering, you know, we when the guys first got there, I think some of them lived in tents for a while uh, down around Saigon. But uh, where I was, uh, was in the train, was up country. And believe it or not, it's a beach city. It's right on the s South China Sea. Uh, and beautiful beaches are white. Uh, you can leave the beach and walk out into the into the what you call the swimming area. You can probably walk 300 yards out there, never get above your shoulders. It's just, uh, and the water's clean and clear. Uh, and that city is still that way. Uh, it's uh, it was a uh, it was a big resort city when the French were in control okay. back then. And uh, uh, our buildings were uh, typical. Um, jungle facilities, uh, screens and slatted sides, you know, a lot of breezy air go, going through and rain when it rained a lot. Right. Uh, bunks, you know, we had bunks and uh, good sleeping conditions. But it's the thing that I always I hear from a lot of guys that went to Vietnam is when they first get off the heat and that the heat and the smell got to them. I mean, it hits them. Yeah. It sounds like, I mean, you had a breeze at least. Uh, or, well, yeah. <laughs> or what you the, call it. Uh, the heat is, if you've never lived in Asia, and especially in the jungle, it's really hard to make people understand what it's like uh, in the jungle after a good rain and the temperature is about 105. I mean, you just, every breath is just a labor, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, it causes lack of sleep and that kind of thing. So. That's a, a, a factor, but it wasn't bad. We had, we had at least where I was, we had pretty good chow, uh, good mess hall, and uh, facilities to, you know, buy clean underwear and socks and do those kind of things. Yeah. So he wrote, you wrote, you over there just a year then? Just a year. Tour? Yeah, I, I actually left Mount Vernon. Uh, for California on the 22nd day of December, just three days before, four days, three days before Christmas, excuse me. And I had Christmas before we left and left my wife and boys here and made a stop in the Philippines on the way over for a couple, three days. Uh, they had some jungle survival training going on there. It was, I don't know that it would have been very effective when I think about it now. But, right. But uh, they were doing their best, I guess. Uh, got into uh, Vietnam on, on New Year's Eve. Yeah, just in time to throw my bag on a bunk and run for the run for the bunker because we were having a mortar attack. And uh, that was in Saigon. Uh, went to the Trang the next day. That was, uh, what, the first day of January. Flew my first mission on the 4th. Get yeah. You up there. Yeah. So then, where? So you came back home after a year? Yeah, uh, I was flying. It was December, and I, you know, figured I, it was about the tenth or so of December, and I'm starting to throw away stuff and get ready to pack a bag and get out of there. Figuring I'm not going to leave until about the twentieth, and uh, flew a mission on the fifteenth. Landed. Uh, I'm debriefing in operations and. Uh, my boss comes in and says, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, I'm flying again. He said, yeah, you are. Pack your bag, boy. You're out of here. And I was out of there the next day and was home in 24 hours. Wow. Now, when you came home, different Vietnam vets have different experiences because of the different times they came home from what, I, from what I'm hearing. Yeah. Well, how, I mean, some I of ran into I ran into some of those young idiots walking around the San Francisco airport, and uh, you know I was still in uniform, and uh, they uh, used a lot of profane language and 
uh, called me baby killer and all that stuff and uh, I just kind of smiled went on by and did you had you heard that that was going on so sure you, you so you were, oh yeah we knew what was going you on already yeah or at least if something happened so absolutely you prepared so then what oh home for a month uh, then I packed up and went to Germany to Frankfurt okay well, in the meantime, I'm sorry, in the meantime, I uh, was home on leave for a month and then to uh, uh, back to Goodfellow Air Force Base for a little bit of training for a new flying assignment, uh, and then on to Germany, and uh, got a place to live for my wife and kids, and they came, came in about two months later, and that was four and a half years. And that's, and that's of course, is still when the Berlin Wall was up. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're talking 1970, uh, 69 actually, late 69, 70, clear up through 74. Uh, I said I was there four and a half years and the Cold War was about as hot as it ever got during that period. Uh, flying recon missions that we were uh, in the areas that we were flying were probably as dangerous if not more than the ones we flew in Vietnam. Uh, back then, the Russians had had sh literally shot down more than one of our airplanes. Uh, because I wasn't in the States when that went on, for the most part, uh, I don't know how, or even if the American people even knew it. Right. Uh, and oh, I can regress here a little bit and tell you that in 1958, a C-130 with 16 people on board was shot down on the Armenian border, not far from where I was stationed. This is an Air Force airplane, and it had positions on board, and they were copy and code. Mm -hmm. Was shot down by three Russian MiG-15s. All 16 people were born and or were killed, and it was 40 years before the United States government openly admitted that it happened. Wow. So, so you were flying across. East Germany. And well, not flying literally across East Germany. That's a good way to get killed. Uh, up and down the border. Okay. You know? but, uh, so you weren't really in their airspace? No. Technically. No, but more importantly, most of the flights that I flew were not up and down the border. Uh, we would go up and into, uh, out of Germany, like you're going to go to Denmark, into the uh, bottom of the Baltic Sea make a right and go into the Baltic Sea and fly up and down that coast. Okay. You know, uh, literally in airspace that Russia said was theirs. Back then, Russia uh, claimed uh, 112 miles of airspace from the edge of their country. He said, that's ours. Well, internationally, the United Nations and so forth said, no, 12 miles is it. Right. You know, that's the limit. Take it or leave it. So we're flying, you know, literally right up under their nose, uh, and uh, you know, they would send a Russian fighter out uh, to check us out and do different things more than once, almost on a daily occurrence. It wasn't, we'd have a fighter come out, and uh, of course we had people on board who spoke Russian, and they're listening, and we know the frequencies they're using, and even if we didn't, they weren't hard to find, and we'd listen to what the pilot, if that fighter is saying, to the ground and what the ground's telling him, and uh, you know other things that's going on. They ever shoot at you? No. Uh, the only shooting incident that I'm aware of uh, was about 19 and mm -hmm, I don't remember the year now. 72, 73, uh, when Gaddafi sent out two uh, uh, Russian-built airplanes out of Libya and shot at one of our C-130s that was flying similar missions in the Mediterranean. And he did, uh, they did hit the aircraft, did damage to it, and wounded one of the guys on board. Of course, our, our president went and said, don't do that again, we're not going to let you do that, you know. We'll be back there tomorrow, and we were back there tomorrow. And uh, we had a couple of our own airplanes flying a cap, and he, as soon as he sent out his two airplanes, went down there, shot a boat down, that was the end of it. He never did it again. Right. Of course, it wasn't long after that that Mr. Reagan sent in a team and they bombed his house and did all sorts of wonderful things. Yeah. 
So, okay, so then from Germany. Well, I was in Germany until 74. Came back, uh, late 73 actually, I guess it was. Came back to the United States to Omaha, Nebraska. Well, this time we're flying long range reconnaissance missions, doing the same thing, only in a different airplane. This time we're using uh, Boeing 707s. Okay. Uh, rigged with uh, 15 or 16 positions in it. Take off from Omaha, fly up over the Bering Sea, meet a tanker, do an air to air refueling. Thing would be so full of fuel it would just wallow like a whole pig in the air, you know. And fly from there, uh, clear across the top of the world, follow the Russian landmass uh, to just about Norway. Meet another tanker, fill it up, do the whole thing coming back. Uh, about 23 hours or so without coming down. And uh, did that for a year or so, and uh, coming back one day, and you have to keep in mind that now I'm in, th I'm in my 30s, mid-30s. And when you're flying 23 hours at a time, living on coffee and black coffee and cigarettes, uh, it's kind of like being a professional sports person. When you hit your 30s, you're getting too old to be doing this kind of stuff. And uh, I'm coming back on one of those missions one day, and as, as we come around the corner back into the Bering Sea, heading towards Omaha, and I said, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And I quit flying that day. So Went to the boss and said, that's it. I'm not going to fly anymore. So I got a different job, and I did that until I retired in 1977. So that was okay? You could just go in and say? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When you're handling that kind of classified material and flying that kind of a mission, uh, they don't mess with you. People are, Those people are, that do that job are treated very well. I'll give you a piece of information. A gentleman who's very high up in our government today uh, told me and another uh, with a group of people one day that when he was a younger officer in the Air Force, he was part of a uh, team that did a, a uh, survey of the people that did this job. Not only the Morris operators, but the voice people that were trained and generally the people that do this kind of work for, for our government. They are considered the top 1% of the top 1% of the people that join the Air Force. Wow. You don't get in, you don't get into this command or in, into this command, you don't get into that job with just a high school education. Almost all the people that work there speak three to four languages read, write, and speak three to four languages. They all have college degrees. Some of them have master's degrees. Uh, but yet they're just regular Air Force people when you see them on the street. Right. I had a question that went right out of my head. It'll come back to me. Thank you. Yes. When you were talking about the top 1% of the top 1%, I'm just thinking I mean, it had to be a very stressful job, I would think. Oh, yeah. And and that was one of the reasons that made me quit flying. The stress was uh, uh, was terrible, and considering that if you're flying a 23-hour mission, as an example, the longest one I flew was 23 hours and 46 minutes. Uh, when you fly that long under those kind of conditions, you just don't lay down and go to sleep when you're back. You know, the adrenaline is just charging through your system. Uh, I got to the point that the only place I could lay down and sleep was the middle of the living room floor, believe it or not. <laughs> it's crazy, but it's true. I could lay down in the middle of the living room floor, fall asleep, and sleep for maybe an hour, and that would kind of get you down, you right. know, off of that high. And then you could go to bed? Yeah. And then you could, you know, get something to eat and do, do things that normal people do. And when you're doing that, uh, oh, an average of once a week, but uh, and you're working a day job on top of that. I mean, okay. you know, you fly that mission, you land 24 hours later, you're on duty doing your day job, you know, which is processing that intelligence and, and or getting ready to do the next one. And, uh, you know, sometimes you do two of those in a week. And you people talk about how tough shift work is. Try that once. 
to say because you're you're awake the whole time. I mean, you can't oh, absolutely, sleep. absolutely. Well, you take off Mohawk, of course, you're rested and you're that's the first one. So you know, sit around and do nothing, listen to radio and do paperwork until you get to the to the Bering Sea, and then you got to suit up with an oxygen mask to take on the fuel, uh, and then from then on you're on the on the clock, you know, and you're on the clock until you get back to the Bering Sea. So 23 hours, figure three hours up and back. But, you know, and when you're coming back, you've got all this stuff that you have, uh, recordings and paperwork and information that you've written down and you get it ready to turn into the, to the intelligence analysts when you get back, you know? When, when, yeah, when you got out, did they tell you what you could talk about and what you couldn't? You knew. You know. The stuff that, that I'm talking about now pretty much been declassified. Some of these missions are still being flown, but it's my job doesn't even exist anymore on those airplanes, okay. and very little of it on the ground. Um, um, the specific information, you're not getting any of that. You know, there's... Uh, and I'm sure a good bit of it's been declassified because it's been 40 years, right. you know, since I've been out almost. So, uh, uh, but we're not going to get into that, you know. Well, yeah, because you don't know for sure what's declassified and what's not. Well, I don't want to jeopardize those people who are up there doing the job right. now. You know, I can guarantee you that right this very minute, one of our planes is over the Middle East somewhere. They're up there listening. What's going on? Putting so, it down and shipping it back. So they still, even today, they're still having to use the planes. Over. They, oh, absolutely. They can't just pick up off uh, off the ground. And well, yeah, you know, the majority of that stuff back then, where we had maybe a hundred positions, you know, with these guys all copying code and all that stuff. Since they're not using code anymore, they're using other other types of communications, you know. But we send a satellite over. Or we've got a satellite parked up there. Mm -hmm. The satellite just sucks up all that information, goes over someplace here in the United States, and I won't go into where right. that is, and just send it all down, and then they process it on the ground. You know, uh, you know, we talk about telephone service. You know, uh, the Middle East obviously they have to have some kind of telephone service. Or something to communicate between those two caves that they're living in, yeah. you know. And if we can get it and pinpoint it, now we know where you're at, buddy. We know that you're going to leave by there and go to by truck to such and such right. a place, and we're waiting. So when you so when you got out, where did you go? Did you come back here? Or? Actually, we did. Uh, my wife's mother was quite ill at that time. Her dad had already passed away, and. Um, um, we came back to uh, Mount Vernon, to this area, and uh, found a house in Gahanna, and uh, which is a suburb of Columbus, and got the kids in school. And uh, I went to work uh, for a company called Cardinal Builders, mm -hmm. and uh, I did uh, I hung storm doors and inspected window jobs for them for a couple of years, and said, "Yeah, this isn't any fun." And uh, about that time, there was a bank in Columbus called Chemical Bank. And at that time, there were a lot of mortgage companies that were going belly up. I don't know how old you are, whether you remember that. But anyhow, that was going on. I was in the late 70s, hey, early 80s, early 80s. And Chemical Bank was buying them up by the handfuls, you know. And every one of them would have 50,000 mortgages out there, and half of them were in arrears. So they hired me, and I had a team of about eight people, and my job was to take 25,000 mortgages, process them, talk to the people that, that they belong to, and say, pay your bill or move on. And uh, that's what we did. And uh, in the meantime, a friend of mine worked for the Attorney General's office. The bus strike in Columbus happened back then, about that time. This was about 1985 or 6. He called me one day and said, Hey, while the bus strikes on, can I ride back and forth downtown with you? Sure. And uh, he was 
after a while, probably pretty easy to figure out, I wasn't real happy with my job at Chemical Bank. He said, you ever consider being an investigator? And I said, never been in law enforcement, don't know anything about it. And he said, I said, how much do they pay? <laughs> and he told me, and I said, where do I sign up? <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, he got me a form, and I filled it out, and he took it to, to uh, the Attorney General's office and gave it to uh, uh, a fellow that he knew who happened to be a chief investigator of the consumer fraud section who made a copy and gave it to his secretary and said, call personnel, tell them I want to see this guy right now. And uh, I went over for what was supposed to be a 45-minute interview and was there for two and a half hours and, and uh, got to meet everybody in the section and uh, it, was a, it was a good uh, interview. And when I went home that night, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to be working for the AG within a year. And uh, that was in June, I think. And uh, in September, they called me and said, would you like to work for us? And I worked for them until I retired in 2000 as an investigator. It was uh, the second best job I've ever had in my entire career. You're, you said your wife was from here. Had, had you known her then before, before you went to school? My wife and I knew each other back uh, in late grade school. Okay. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, where the uh, Velvet Ice Cream Company is, just outside of Utica, there's a Quonset Hut type building that their factory's in. Okay. Back then, that was a skating rink. Mm -hmm. I've heard that. Okay. And it was a skating rink back in the 40s, but I don't know what the original date was. And uh, that's where we met as young adults, I guess. We were freshmen in high school. She was going to Palfrey, I was going to Utica. And that's where, back then, carloads of kids showed up there every Friday and Saturday night, you know? Yeah. And uh, that's where we met. And uh, when I came back from that turkey assignment in 1959, ran into her again, and uh, we were married six months later. Wow. Been married ever since. <laughs> 55 years now. That's great. And uh, did any of your kids go in the military? One of my sons went in the Army, and he was in the Army as a military policeman, uh, but he got out after after uh, the first tour. He said the Army was not where he wanted. Tried to get him to go in the Air Force. I think if he had to be, he'd have probably stayed. There's a, a whole world of difference between four years in the Army and four years in the Air Force, or four years in the Navy, four years in the Marines. Uh, the Air Force treats their people very, very well by comparison. Good quarters, good meals, good good everything just about. Right. Uh, you know, the Army is give you a gun and go play in the dirt. <laughs> yeah. I'd say that about my Army brethren, but it's true. Right. That's where they are. That's where they do their work. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they get trained to do. Yeah. Marines are the same way. So you still keep track, you still, you say you still have reunions with your buddies? We have a, there's the group that was in Vietnam. Okay. Uh, many of those guys uh, worked together before Vietnam. Uh, you know, they, when they were new guys, they sat side by side in one of those hundred position buildings, you know, with no windows and one door, that kind of thing. And so when they went to Vietnam, they, yeah, they, uh, still knew each other, flew together, uh, um, and they still know each other. We still hang out. We still, I get 20 emails a day from guys that I first met in Turkey in 1959 or Italy in 1965, and, and uh, you know, we know our, well, we know each other's wives and kids. We know their grandkids and who's sick and who's not sick right. and, and who's got Parkinson's and who don't. And, it just goes on and on and on, you know. Hey, have you gone back to Europe or Vietnam? No, I have not. I have no no desire to go back to Vietnam at all. Would certainly like to go back and tour Europe. But uh, I don't have the kind of funds to do the kind of tour I have in mind. <laughs> I've told my kids if something happens to my wife, I'm going to sell out and I'm going to Greece and stay there until my days are over. I like Greece a lot. So you got you did get to travel some when you were over there. Well, yeah, you know you can't be you can't live in the middle of Germany and not travel around Germany. Right. It's like living in Columbus. You, of course, you go. Well, not everybody does, but 
you know, you go to West Virginia, you go to Pennsylvania, Michigan, and so forth. It was only an hour and a half from from our apartment to Luxembourg, as an example. You know, yeah. poor little old country is only sixty miles long. It's got a castle in every square mile. <laughs> you know, so we go to church on Sunday and then drive to Luxembourg for lunch. Oh, that's neat. And uh, you know, we took a week once and went to uh, uh, left left Germany and drove to Holland. A couple of days in Holland, then over to Belgium, where my family comes from, and from Belgium into the corner of Spain or uh, France, mm -hmm. and then back through the Black Forest and back into to Frankfurt, and then the next vacation was south into the Alps, to Garmisch and all those wonderful places down there. And when we were in Italy, we drove up to Naples and Rome, and that's just like going from state to state here. Sure, yeah, sure, it exactly is. You know, Germany's about the same size as Ohio, if you put it all together. Holland, Belgium, they're just just wee drops in the world, you know. What would you say to somebody that's thinking about a career, a young person in the service? I was wondering if you were going to ask me that, because it's happened a lot since I retired. Uh, <clears throat> I talked to them over a period of time and tried to tell them at least from my perspective, what living in the Air Force is like. It takes a different breed of cat to go in there and stay for 20 years. Uh, there are times when you just, you want to run. I mean, it's no matter what your job is, you just want to pack up and run as far away from there as you can get, you know, uh, as people are in regular jobs, I suppose. Um, but from the point of friendship and camaraderie, uh, uh, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it anywhere. You know, I can, I can sit here and name off 50 guys who I've known for 50 years or more that were military buddies. Mm -hmm. I can't name probably two or three that are civilians. Maybe a couple of people I went to high school with, but no, I can't even remember the people I went to high school. Right. It's insignificant to me. Uh, at one point in time, uh, <clears throat> after our kids all graduated from high school, went off to college and so forth, we sold our house in Guyana and we moved out here on Goose Lane. Hadn't been there but just uh, maybe six months and one of the neighbor boys came to the door. Wanted to know, said he's thinking about going into service and specifically the Air Force and would I talk to him about that. And we spent a whole afternoon sitting on my back porch talking about the Air Force and military in general. And I talked to him, I asked him a lot of very pointed questions about why he was going in the military and so forth in his high school career and that kind of thing. And he joined the Air Force. He's still in the Air Force. He's only got four more years and he'll be retired. Wow. Yeah. And uh, he's got more rank now than I had when I retired. He's uh, very, very intelligent. His high school grade point average was about 3.7, so he wasn't a dummy when he right. went in. He uh, works with the Department of Defense computers that control armaments and munitions. Uh, he works with that computer that uh, at some point in time, if the Russian Soviets or if the president ever needs to take any action against somebody, that's how it'll be confirmed to be the computers that he makes talk to each other. Mm -hmm. wow. And he'll walk out of the Air Force with, with 20, 22 probably uh, years of service and he'll have a job the day he walks out making three times more than he's making in the Air Force. But he's like me, he wouldn't give it up for nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's got to make you feel good. I mean, I think that you oh, kind yeah. of mentored him a little bit. You know, yeah, absolutely. Preparing. And I've had several other people come to me. I, uh, about a year ago I had a young man from here in Newark. Uh, I met his dad at a, at a woodcarver's meeting and, uh, and I sat down and talked to him and he said, what do you think about me joining the Air Force? And I had the same kind of conversation with him and I told him I thought he probably ought to consider the Navy or the Marines or go play in the dirt. I didn't think he. I just didn't think that he would make it in the Air Force. 
did, so did he. Did He's in the Marines. Is he? Yeah. And you mentioned your wood carving because is that something you've always done? No, I didn't start wood carving until about 10 or 11 years ago. My father was a cabinet maker and owned a construction business, built homes.